All right, so let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'm going to actually share the screen out for those of you who may not have your Bible in front of you. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Here we go. All right. Praise God. And I'll just read it here from the screen. I have in my Bible app, I have, I can split the screen so I can go to one uh, portion of the Bible and then I can go to another portion of the Bible. And that's what I want to do here. So I want to reiterate here just for a little bit. So last week, we introduced um, Ecclesiastes chapter one, and we introduced Solomon. Solomon, as the Bible says here, the words of the pre the words of the preacher, verse one, over to the right, my right, maybe your left, but the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. So it's established that Solomon, the third king of Israel, is this is his writing. And the Bible refers to him as the preacher, right? And we'll jump into verse 12 and start it there as well. So preacher, he was a proclaimer. Now at this time in history, in the time of Israel, uh, they had priests and they had the clergy, but here Solomon, he wasn't a part of the clergy. He wasn't of the Levitical priesthood uh, or the tribe of Levi. We know that David, uh, his father and generations after him, they're all of the tribe of Judah. So he wasn't a preacher as we, in today's society, the preacher is a part of the clergy, right? Um, again, they had their religious order and religious structure, but yet he called himself a preacher, the preacher, which simply means a proclaimer. He proclaimed the word of God. So every one of us, we could technically say we're a preacher, we're proclaiming the word of God, the good news of God. So with that, last week, call it part one, we talked about Solomon and how he led up to this point or how he led up to the point of writing the book of Ecclesiastes. And we talked about the anointing of Solomon, first Kings chapter three, he was anointed to be king. And then we talked about the prayer and the blessings of Solomon in first king, how he prayed and asked God for certain things, wisdom, understanding, or knowledge, so that he could lead God's great people. And we read in first Kings chapter three, one through 14, how God said, I'm going to give you wisdom, understanding, discernment, so you can lead my people, but I'm going to give you all the things that you did not ask for, right? So we read about all those things. And then also in first Kings, chapter one, verse 46, or excuse me, first Kings chapter 11, it tells us about the fall of Solomon, the failure and the fall of Solomon. Failure, which leads to um, a fall. The Bible says Solomon loved many strange women. And this was contrary to what God had told him. And as a result of his failure, to follow that which God had told him and instructed him, it led to his fall. And we read that in 1 Kings chapter 11, starting in verse one. Nevertheless, we do not read that, we don't find in the Bible that Solomon recovered, repented. It doesn't say it specifically, at least I haven't read it, um, or I haven't come across it in the years I've been a Christian. Nevertheless, Solomon, it is believed that during his reign, his reign over the kingdom of Israel, that's when he produced um, many of the Proverbs, which we have the book of Proverbs, chapter one through 31. He wrote all those Proverbs during this time. Also, during his reign, he also it is attributed to him, the song of Solomon. 
So it's more of a romantic, uh, romantic, romantical, romantic poem, um, the Song of Solomon, and then Proverbs, instructions on life, wisdom, uh, nuggets in life. And then we also have Ecclesiastes. As we read the context of Ecclesiastes, and oftentimes, traditionally, Ecclesiastes chapter two and chapter three is referred to. There's a time under heaven, uh, a time to be born, a time to die. That's in chapter three. A time for this, a time for that. And historically, we've heard that. And culturally, we've heard that in the church and we've heard it in conversation. But oftentimes, I have found in my experience, Proverbs, I mean, excuse me, Ecclesiastes is really not explained to the believer. So that's what we want to do here. And the purpose of Bible study is to whet your appetite concerning a particular book, one of the purposes, reasons. So again, we probably will not go through all 12, 13 chapters, however many chapters there are in Ecclesiastes, but we want to share enough to give you a, a synopsis and an overview of the intent of the writer and the intent of God um, ministering to us through the word of God by the Holy Spirit. So that's why I introduced Solomon, right? Looked at his life on an overall scale, his successes, his prayers, his blessings, but also his failure to obey what God said and his failure led to his fall. So now we move into Ecclesiastes. It is believed that Ecclesiastes was written after Solomon came to a realization of his folly, a realization that everything in the world is vanity, because he had everything. We'll talk about that again. He had a thousand women at his disposal, right? Uh, what was it, 700 wives, 300 concubines, or vice versa, whatever the number came up to a thousand. He had all the riches and all these things. He would probably be in our modern day, he would probably be labeled as the richest man in the world as he was the richest man in the world in his day. So he had all these things uh, in front of him at his disposal to use to um, everything that a person would look at to bring them a wonderful quality of life. But Ecclesiastes is believed to have been written after his fall and his return to God, his repentance, his realization, and his return to God. The very content of the book chapter one and moving through the various chapters, it really highlights that this man came to the conclusion that all the things that he acquired and all the things that he did in the past, he came to the conclusion that all is vanity outside of God. So that's kind of what we introduce. So tonight, I want to go into part two, still looking at the topic um, the preacher's perspective on life, the preacher's perspective on life. And let me close this real quick. Let me stop to share. The preacher's perspective on life. So I kind of gave you a little synopsis and a kind of a catch up on, on where we, what we've already talked about. So part two, I want to deal with the first key word I dealt with was vanity. Tonight, as I was praying and just thinking, okay, God, one of the purposes of Bible study is so that we can apply it in our lives, so that we can look internally, right? Look internally at ourselves and measure our lives with the word of God. Not measure my life against someone else's life, but measure my life according to what God has said in his word. So that in hearing and in measuring my life with the word of God, I can find out what God would have for me to do in my life, how God would want me to live. Therefore, we're not allowing another person to regulate our relationship with Jesus or our regulate our righteousness in Jesus, but we're looking to the word of God to regulate, to govern, to teach, and to uh, show us 
how we are to live for Jesus Christ, all right? So again, it's it's an overview synopsis to whet the appetite, as they say, to whet the appetite so that we would in further on study, all right? So part two, tonight I want to focus on, and we'll read this here in just a moment, we talked about vanity, and we'll still continue to use that thread of vanity, but also never satisfied, never satisfied. And even before I get into this part, I would like to share with you what, what Solomon wrote in Proverbs 27, verse 20. These are his words. He says, hell and destruction are never full. Again, that's Proverbs 27, verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of a man are never satisfied. The eyes of a man are never satisfied. So I want you to think about that thread and apply it to your own life. Brothers and sisters, regardless of what we obtain in life, be it financially, be it um, educationally, if you wanna call it that, materially, nothing really satisfies the soul. You can, you can acquire finances. You say, if I just had X amount of dollars, I would be happy. It can bring a sense of happiness, a temporal happiness, but it will not bring joy. You can go on vacations and go to the very exotic places of the world that you have heard and read and, and seen pictures of. And that's great, that's wonderful. And it will make you happy. But you always have to return to the reality of life. And when we return to the reality of life, the void of satisfaction will once again arise. So Solomon said it. He said, man is never satisfied. Let's see if I can find that. Oops, sorry. Man is never satisfied. The eyes of man. So you can buy something new and you can buy it, purchase it in a particular color. And as you're taking that new purchase home with that particular color, uh, of that particular color, you can see that same item, same model, same year, same everything in a different color and begin to tell yourself, oh, I wish I would have got it in that color. What, what is that indication of? That's an indication letting us know that man is never satisfied. The eyes of man are never satisfied. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Talks about those three things. The lust of the eyes. See, brothers and sisters, it's our eyes that tell us you need that. Or our eyes see something, and our eyes communicate to our minds and communicate to our flesh that you, you need that. Well, the eyes truly, in reality, the eyes are communicating you want that. And wanting that may indeed make you happy, fulfill a, a desire that's in your heart, um, whatever the eyes may tell us. So hence, this is kind of going off track a little bit, but still keeping it together. Hence, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe it is, says we walk by faith and not by sight because that which we see communicates to our flesh, the lust of our flesh, and it may not be the will of God for our lives. Or it may deceive us and say, this... This mug of tea, this cup of tea will satisfy your thirst. You see it, it looks good, you smell it, taste it, and it 
gave me a temporal satisfaction, but I'm going to thirst again. Isn't that what Jesus told the woman, the Samaritan woman, John chapter four? I'll give you water to drink that you will never thirst again, all right? So it was beyond physical, it was spiritual. So these are some of the things Solomon realized after he had everything at his disposal. All right, so Solomon is the author of this book. I've already shared it with you. Let me read a quick narrative here. And the author of this book, Solomon, the preacher, he had a purpose for writing. And it's very, uh, he wrote it very in a very pessimistic way. So you have optimistic, positive, you have uh, pessimistic, which is considered, you know, the opposite of opposite, right? It's not positive, it can be viewed as negative. But he really wanted to highlight, as I read it, he really wanted to highlight life as we all live it. Doesn't matter what generation, but life. So hence, this is the preacher's perspective on life based on his exposure, his experiences of life, based on his exposure, his experience of having everything that life has to offer. And he came to the conclusion, it's all vanity. So it is believed that at the near the end of his life, as he looked back on everything that he had and everything he had done, construction, building his house is one of the wonders of the uh, known world at that time, uh, building the temple unto God and all these wonderful things. He saw it all and realized that it was meaningless, meaningless in the viewpoint of eternity when you compare it to eternity. There was and probably still is a common belief was that back in this time, as I read and studied it, that good people prospered and wicked ones suffered. And that may be a belief today, I don't know. But that had, had been proven not true. Listen to me here. That wasn't proven true with Solomon, Solomon's experience. He prospered, but he was miserable. Solomon wrote this book after he had tried everything and had achieved much, only to find that nothing a part of God brought joy and eternal assurance. He wanted his readers, he desired his readers, to avoid the same seamless pursuits. So we have the word of God, we have the Bible. And in the Bible, God exposes us to the lives of all these different individuals so that we will not repeat the same things that they did or we can learn from them so we can avoid them. If we try to find meaning and we can see this maybe in our own lives or in the lives of those we're close to. You try to find meaning in your accomplishments. People try to find meaning in their accomplishments. And accomplishments, go for it. I mean, it, it, it does something to us, right? It builds esteem, self-esteem and confidence and, and all these different things. So we're not negating that, but we're saying keep it in the perspective and put God, keep God, put God first and keep God in the equation of your life. Solomon excluded God from the equation of his life. We know this to be true. We know that you can have accomplishment because God told Solomon, I'm going to give you all these things. So you can accomplish. God never faulted Solomon for building the temple. He never faulted Solomon for building his house. We don't read in the Bible that God faults men and women for accomplishing various things, but he doesn't want us to make those things an idol or to allow those things to separate us from having a relationship with him, right? So if we try to find meaning, 
What does my life mean? What is my, what is the purpose of my life? In our accomplishments, rather than in God, we will never be satisfied. And everything we pursue becomes meaningless. And I believe, this is just my personal belief, I wonder if this train of thought, this mindset, trying to find meaning in one's accomplishments, I wonder if it's led many to be depressed when they don't accomplish something. I went to college, but I didn't graduate, I dropped out. And it leads to depression, it leads to discouragement and all these different things. But we find meaning, when we find meaning in God, we identify with God. We live in his will, his purpose for our lives. It changes our outlook, it changes our perspective, all right? So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into this. So Ecclesiastes chapter one, hold your place there, but let me read, let me read first Kings chapter 10, verse 23 and 24. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 23 and 24 highlights uh, what I've already said. So here it is. So King Solomon, verse 23 here, uh, stop. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought, sought, sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. So he exceeded all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, insomuch that all the uh, kings on the earth, the Bible tells us, the parallel scripture of this is Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 22 and 23. It pretty much says the same thing. All the kings on the earth, they sought Solomon for his wisdom. And they looked at his riches, right? So he had all these things, brothers and sisters. All these things he had obtained. And yet, he wasn't satisfied. He wasn't satisfied. So now, after all these things he acquired, let's go to Ecclesiastes here. And let's go to verse 12. Because he's already said, all is vanity, right? Everything under the sun, all is vanity. Not that you can't use it. You can use it. Just don't abuse it and don't, don't put it before God in your life. So now here, Ecclesiastes on this side, verse 12. Again, re-emphasizing that it's Solomon. He said, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Verse 13, I gave or I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom, we know he had all this wisdom. So by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. So I wanted to search out what's all these things going on under heaven. And he had the resources where he can hire the people. He can bring, they could bring uh, writings and various things from other cultures. And so he had the resources to do all this. So he set his heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail, let's look what that word said, this grievous task, this was a grievous task, travail have God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. So this was a task that maybe was a little beyond him, and was that God's will for him? Nevertheless, he said he set his heart and to search out by wisdom concerning all things done under heaven. Let's go to verse 14. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. This is the conclusion he came to. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. So again, brothers and sisters, I want you to, I don't want to take the with a grain of salt, but understand it's okay to obtain, 
It's okay to do. It's okay to go. But realize that once you obtained, once you do, once you go, you have to return. And you can enjoy those things, but just keep in perspective that they will not bring the joy of Jesus to your heart and your life. They'll make you happy, but only the joy of Jesus truly satisfies, right? Only the joy of Jesus truly brings eternal assurance to our lives, right? So Solomon said, he all the works under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation. Then verse 17, let's go down to verse 17. Well, let's look at 16 as well. He says, I communed within my own heart, so meditated and thought and considered within his heart, saying, lo, I am, I am come to great estate, great wealth, great possessions, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me. That's where we go back over here and it talks about it, right? Verse 23 and 24, right here. To hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. So he had all this wisdom, right? So he says here back in Ecclesiastes, he says, and I have got more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 17, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived or I understood that it is this also is also vexation of spirit. Verse 18, for in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. So let's talk about that. Let me close this up. So Solomon, he came to the conclusion that the blessing, let's look at this. He asked God for wisdom. He asked God for knowledge. He asked God for understanding. He asked God for discernment. But he came to the conclusion there in Ecclesiastes chapter one, the last verse. He said, when knowledge increase, when wisdom increase, Something comes with that, right? And what did Jesus say in the word of God? He said, too much is given, much is required. So God, I'm going to ask you for this. Well, there's an accountability and there's a stewardship that comes with it. So as we're looking at life, even our lives, as believers, when you're praying for God, uh, praying to God for something, be it for a job. God, give me a job. Well, the door may open for him to give you a job. With that job, there's something that comes with it. It's called work, right? And not just work, but being a testimony for the one who gave you that job. Same thing. God, give me a car. With that car, comes a responsibility of following the laws of the land while you operate that vehicle, right? So too much is given, much is required. And God helps us as we keep him in the equation of our lives. Why am I sharing this? I'm sharing this because God desires to bless us. As we go back in the word of God, God gave Adam dominion over the world. But Adam was to keep God number one in his life. God gave Solomon everything that one could ask. God gave to Solomon that which we ask for. He met all his needs. He gave them the, him the desires of his heart as the psalmist wrote, Psalm 37. You walk uprightly before the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. With that, brothers and sisters, comes stewardship, comes accountability and responsibility. And the accountability and responsibility I want to focus on is 
keeping God in his rightful place in our lives. Because obtaining even knowledge, not just material things, I'm not talking about just material things, that's a part of it, or accolades or position or material substance, but even knowledge, even biblical knowledge, scriptural knowledge, there's a responsibility that comes with that. And that is keeping God in his rightful place in our hearts. And his rightful place is number one. For Jesus said what? In Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first. What does Solomon say? We read it to you. He said in, first, uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse 13, I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all the things that are done under heaven. What are you doing, Solomon? God said, and Jesus said in the model prayer, he said, when you pray, pray our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Solomon began to seek and search out by the wisdom he had, the blessing, the gift that God had given him. He began to use it to seek and search all the things that are done under heaven versus seeking God's will. He said, Jesus said, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let me seek God's will. And in seeking God's will, through the power of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, he will reveal to us that which he desires to reveal to us, that which we need for our personal lives, for our families, and to lift up Jesus to all humanity. So Solomon began to seek and search out by the wisdom, by the blessing God had given him, all things done under the sun. Let us ask ourselves, what am I seeking? What am I searching out? Am I seeking riches? Am I seeking a husband? Am I seeking a wife? Am I seeking whatever it may be? What are you seeking in the depths of your soul? Are you seeking a greater relationship with Jesus? Are you seeking something in this world? Thinking it's going to satisfy a void that's in your heart. That's an honest question we have to ask ourselves. And as we do Bible study and as we look at Ecclesiastes, see, the Bible is not for, inter this is my dissertation. The Bible is not for our entertainment. Going to a church service should not be for our entertainment. It should be for our spiritual growth and spiritual development. Jesus said, when it comes to seeking, I believe it's in John chapter five. He says, search or seek out the scriptures for in them, you believe you have eternal life. He didn't say you didn't have eternal life. He said, seek out the scriptures, search out the scriptures to verify in your heart and in your soul that you have, you're in the family of God. You have eternal life. What did Jeremiah say? Jeremiah 29, God said, through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. He says, when you seek for me with all your heart, that's when you shall find me. What did God say in 2 Chronicles? Solomon, right? 2 Chronicles chapter seven, when Solomon was dedicating the temple. Chapter seven, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, Turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will heal the end. Seek my face. So what's the question I have for you? You answer to yourself. What are you seeking? Solomon sought these other things. Let me seek the answer for this. Let me seek the answer for that. Let me seek out what it really means to be happy. Let me seek out how to acquire joy. Let me seek out this. Let me seek out that. 
And as human beings, we use all this energy to try to obtain and try to satisfy something that only comes to our hearts, to our souls, to our lives through Jesus Christ. I have shared over the years that the devil presents a counterfeit Christianity, a counterfeit satisfaction, a counterfeit joy, a counterfeit. It's not real. It looks like God. It looks like, it tastes like satisfaction, but it's not satisfaction. He did it with Adam and Eve, brothers and sisters, as we look at the word of God. Adam and Eve in the garden, standing by the tree, the serpent, the devil spoke through the serpent, used the serpent, the snake, as an agent. He said, if you eat of this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it'll make you gods. It'll satisfy you. What he did, he deceived them and he used the words and he tries to use these words on you and I, brothers and sisters. That's why it's so important Bible study, so important to have a relationship with God, so important to meditate on that which you've heard uh, from the word of God. You've read, you heard, however you receive the word of God. The devil got ten, got Adam and Eve, both of them, to doubt and to think that they were missing something. He said, if you eat of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, so he got them to think that you're missing some knowledge. He said, you'll be like God not realizing that they were created in God's image and his likeness, that God had given them dominion, but he manipulated and deceived them into thinking they were missing something. And what did that create in their heart? What did that create in their mind? It created a mindset and a void of satisfaction. Well, if you eat of this fruit, You'll gain this knowledge, and now you'll really be complete. You'll be satisfied. He tried to do it with Jesus in John or Matthew chapter 4. He said, Jesus, if you bow down to me, he took him up on a high pinnacle, and he showed him all the kingdoms, and he said, if you bow down to me, I'll make you king over all these kingdoms. Jesus is already the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But he was presenting to him this counterfeit truth to satisfy the soul. Even before that, Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew 4, he was in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. And when he had finished, then the tempter came. And what did the tempter do? He knew Jesus had been fasting for 40 days without food. He said, if you be the son of God, he challenged his divinity. If you be the son of God, and if you are the son of God, I know you can perform the supernatural. You can perform a miracle. Your flesh hasn't eaten. So if you are divine, you are divinity then perform this supernatural act on these stones, these rocks, and turn them into bread to feed your flesh, satisfy your flesh. The devil is very tricky. He may not tell you or me to just go right out there and sin, but he may challenge us and say, if you be a child of God, if you are saved, then you have the power of God to do this and to do that. You can satisfy. That's where you can satisfy your soul by doing this or doing that. And that's a deception because oftentimes, and I've done it, I've been guilty of it, where I submitted to that. And then I felt like a, as the term goes, a dog. I felt horrible. I, it, whether it was action 
or even thinking something. It can also be thinking. The devil tricks us to think about that. They did you wrong or whatever the case and think about it and meditate on it and on and on and on and on and on. We have to weigh in our minds like Solomon and come to the conclusion, all this is vanity. Will I be satisfied if I'm if I not get upset, if I stay upset? Will it satisfy your soul? Or will it just make you angry? Will it just make you bitter? Brothers and sisters, as Solomon, maybe he was pursuing life, pursuing satisfaction in life. Hence, think about this logically. What does one man need with 1,000 women at his disposal? That's just a stroke of one's ego. Even look at it, and I'm not preaching poor or preaching uh, poor mouthing or preaching prosperity, not at all. What does one man need with, let's just say, let's put a figure out there, $1 billion? Well, I, I would be able to buy all the things I want. Yes, you would. And the things you want, are they a direct reflection of the things you think will satisfy you? Well, when I'm hungry, I'll be able to buy food. You don't need a billion dollars to, to fill your belly. Well, I could go on vacation. You don't need $100,000 to go on vacation. So we have to look at life from a perspective of balance, right? And we have to ask God, Lord, give me balance because the flesh, your flesh and my flesh will crave certain things. And then we have the devil, the enemy of your soul and my soul, all of our soul. He's shooting those fiery darts, those thoughts. This will satisfy you. This will satisfy you. It's a deception from the depths of hell because once you engage yourself in it, you're miserable. Hence, let me just use this. Many, there are people that are addicted to various things. Illegal uh, narcotics, drugs, people are addicted to those things. Trying to satisfy that high that they got once before. There are people who are addicted to alcohol and spirits, trying to satisfy that buzz that they once got before. There are men who are addicted to women. Uh, uh, her body, the way she looks, her youth, and all these various things that will satisfy, oops, that will satisfy, um, sorry about that. Let me put this on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That will satisfy my flesh. If I had another woman or a woman, if I had another man, my husband is not satisfying me and my wife is not satisfying me. So I'm looking to this other one to satisfy me. Well, guess what? Let, I'll just speak plain. When that other person wakes up in the morning, they're gonna be just like, not just like your spouse, but they're going to need to do certain hygiene things, brush their teeth, wash their face. They're not gonna look the same maybe not smell the same, you know, there will be things they'll have to do and you'll wake up and realize, boy, they didn't satisfy me. That was a deception. But now you have to deal with the consequences of the decision, the actions of the decisions that you made. And it was all a counterfeit. It was all a counterfeit. Solomon came to this conclusion, brothers and sisters. Hence, he gave us the book of Ecclesiastes. God has given us the book of Ecclesiastes as he spoke through Solomon and Solomon realized this and he said, all is vain and hell and destruction is never full, nor will the eyes of man ever be satisfied because this flesh in our eyes is going to desire more and more and more and more. I have out in my garage, I have things on the shelves that I've bought from Costco and Sam's that's still in the boxes. Oh, you'll use them one day. Well, they've been out there two, three, four years. Some of them have never been opened. Glass sets, different things. 
because you go in there and it's all eye candy. We all have our different eye candy. Lowe's and Costco, those are my eye candy stores. I need that. It's really, I want that. But we convince ourselves to say, I need that right now because it's on sale and I may use it later on. That'll satisfy when I, I need to fix something at home. Well, it's been out there for three years. That thing that you're going to fix at home hasn't even broken. So we tell ourselves and then we listen to the wrong voice and we think those things will satisfy us. And we just got to be real with ourselves. And I'm not, I'm using that, I'm using myself because that's not sinful. It's not sinful to make that purchase, to do those various things. <laughs> Sister, but perfumes are, are her eye candy. <laughs> I like fragrances too. I can say that's eye candy for me as well. But uh, so let's use that fragrance. The fragrance I like is, is, is expensive. You buy that, you spread it on, it's going to make me smell good. Yeah, it makes you smell good. Makes you feel good. And then you wash it off. It's not a permanent satisfaction. Then you got to put it on again. Then you wash it off and put it on. You keep repeating that. It's all going to be gone. So it's an ongoing deal that sucks you in and requires all these resources, right? Not sinful. Not sinful to spray on some uh, uh, fragrance, cologne, perfume, however you want to label it, fragrance, good smelling fragrance, summer, summertime, wintertime. You go outside and attract a whole bunch of bugs. <laughs> but what is it costing you? It may not be sinful, but what is it costing you? What is it taking away from? Is it taking away something from your house and yet is not satisfying? You? Is it taking you away from God and is not satisfying? Solomon realized these things. He said, I commune, verse 16. I communed with my own heart saying, I am come to great estate. I have all these possessions, people possessions, material possessions, as you read 1 Kings, as, as well as uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, as well as uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. There were kings, the queen of Sheba, all these individuals, they were coming and bring inundating him with all this material stuff. The queen of Sheba, the Bible says, she, she brought him all this stuff and Solomon gave her all the things that she desired in her heart. It is believed he impregnated her. She gave birth and she had his son in, in Sheba or really we know it as Ethiopia. His history proves that. But yet that didn't satisfy him. It didn't bring eternal satisfaction. But Solomon was writing here, and in chapter one, I'll stop here. He talked about vanity, and he talked about it didn't satisfy. And that pretty much gave us his perspective on life after returning to God. After returning to God, he realized it's all vanity. You can use it, don't abuse it. Don't put it before God because it's not going to satisfy you. Keep it in perspective. God has given us, say, a phone to use. Not to say every time one comes out, I was telling my wife, we were driving and we heard that uh, the Apple commercial, oh, the new Apple phones, 15 come out. I'm thinking, and I said, they're like cars now. Every year, it's a new model. What's new about it? And then I went on to say, I said, I wonder how much it costs. It's probably about $1,200. I think I said $1,200 or something like that. I came home. I saw on the news the listed price. One of the listed prices on one of them was $1,199. And I'm thinking for a phone. If your iPhone or whatever kind of phone you have currently you don't feel it's satisfying you? That newer model that costs $1,000 is gonna satisfy you or it'll take better pictures. 
Well, it has more storage. You know, we begin to justify ourselves. Solomon, he justified himself. Hence, he had a thousand women. You know what he really did with those thousand women? This is my opinion. No, not my opinion. Because he was the king, he did those women a disservice. Because once he claimed those women, they couldn't marry no one else. Whether he became intimate or not with them, and, and they were probably young because they usually married uh, in the teens or early 20s. So 1,000 women, once Solomon brought them into his harem, they were excluded from ever marrying anyone again, even in his death. They couldn't marry. So he did them a disservice. So I want you to think about it. Some of the things as a Christian, as a believer, that we pursue, we desire, that's not going to satisfy. It's going to bring us temporal happiness, make us temporarily happy. But is it doing someone else? our loved ones, our family members, our children, is it doing them a disservice? If that's the case, then that's very selfish. So the preacher's perspective on life, let me summarize it this way by saying, his perspective on life, as he wrote here in Ecclesiastes in his return back to God, was that I lived a very selfish life. And I realized that my selfishness was all vain and that my selfishness would never be satisfied. Selfishness, vanity, things that will not satisfy, they lead you and I to a life of burden debt, a life of continuous displeasure, stress, tension, comparing ourselves with others, neighbors, people on the job, all these things that are so unchrist like As we look at the preacher's perspective on life, Solomon's life, as you read Ecclesiastes, I encourage you to read just a chapter, two chapters, however much you want, and keep this in mind. It was his return. He, he was reflecting on the selfish life he lived that he thought would bring him satisfaction. But he concluded it was all vain. Let us look at our own lives and put things in perspective. Again, I'm not saying do not enjoy life. That which God blesses you with, be a blessing. Let it be a blessing and be a blessing to others. But life as it exists without God is miserable. You'll always be seeking. You'll always be searching. The Bible tells us there's great gain and content in God. Again, go on vacation. Make your purchases, buy your perfume, buy your cars, buy your cologne, do all these things. Keep God in the equation of your life. The God who blessed Solomon at the start of his reign with wisdom, knowledge, intellect, all these things, materials, resources, all these things gave him favor with all the kings and the queens in the land. If you notice in Kings and the Chronicles that during the reign of Solomon, Israel did not go to war at all. There was peace. They didn't go to war one time during Solomon's reign. But in peace, brothers and sisters, let us make sure we guard our hearts and keep God at the forefront of our lives because the devil also says, peace, 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 but he doesn't tell us there's someone conspiring to go to war with us behind our back. So the preacher's perspective, part two, 
the focus was the eyes of man are never satisfied. Proverbs 27 and 20. Know this to be a truth, brothers and sisters, that all that you obtain, all that I obtain, we're not satisfied, but our satisfaction is in Jesus Christ. Our contentment is in Jesus Christ. Hence, David, the king, Solomon's father wrote, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What was he saying? He was saying, Jehovah is my gyra. He is my provider. So he'll give me everything I need. And he'll also, Psalm 37, give me the desires of my heart. It's up to me to be a stewardship of the relationship that I have with Jesus and keep him first. It's up to you. It's up to me. And brothers and sisters, we have the Holy Spirit. We're empowered with the Holy Spirit, and we can keep Jesus at the forefront of our lives, regardless of the eye candy that's out there, regardless of our flesh yearning. When we just stop, sit back, reevaluate, consider, and all our getting, make sure we get God. And that's what Solomon was saying in Proverbs. All right, praise God. Let us pray as we close. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, once again, we thank you for your goodness, your love, and your faithfulness. We thank you for all those who um, logged on YouTube and are viewing us and will view it at a later time. We pray it's a blessing, Lord. We pray that you help us keep things in perspective, Lord. Like Solomon, he came to the realization and had a different perspective on life after experiencing life his way. And I pray, God, for men and for all of us and for those who, who will not hear this from my voice, I pray they hear it somewhere else. They would read it. They will come to the conclusion that all is vain and that the eyes are never satisfied, but there's great gain and contentment in you, Christ. That is my prayer, Lord. Keep your hand over each one of us. Lead us, guide us, protect us until we meet again. Be blessed, brothers and sisters. That is my prayer. Amen and amen. I'm going to stop the YouTube live at this time. Praise God.